My dearly beloved in Christ, the Sunday following the Epiphany, and this year on the octave day of the Epiphany, this Sunday, this first Sunday after Epiphany, is the Feast of the Holy Family. And it is very important that we reflect upon the Holy Family who serve as models and an example for our Catholic families. And what has always amazed me to reflect upon it is when you think about the Holy Family, the order of holiness is the exact reverse or the exact opposite of the order of authority. In other words, Jesus was God, divine, infinitely above Joseph and Mary, and yet he was submissive to them. It says in today's gospel, when our Lord was found in the temple after three days at the age of 12, that he went down with them to Nazareth and was subject to them. And not just until he was 18 or 21, but until he was 30 years of age. So of those 33 years that our Lord lived on earth, he spent 30 of them in a hidden life in submission to his parents. So our Lord was the child, obedient towards our Blessed Mother and St. Joseph. And then we have Our Lady. Our Blessed Mother was certainly the greatest of all the saints, conceived without original sin, holier than the merits of all the saints put together, far beyond any other saint in heaven. She who was chosen to be the mother of God, and yet she had the role of commanding. She had the role of the mother. And St. Joseph, as holy as St. Joseph was, after our Blessed Mother, above all the saints in heaven, nevertheless, he was far beneath our Blessed Mother, and obviously our Lord. And yet he was the head of the home. So the point here, the lesson is that authority does not depend on personal holiness. Someone can be in a position of authority, and that doesn't mean he is holier or better than those who are under him or her. And so our Lord gives us the example of submission, gives us the example of obedience, towards his creatures, our Blessed Mother and St. Joseph. We know that today, especially, the family is assaulted on all sides. The devil knows that if children are well-trained in the family circle, that if families are strong and united, then the children will be raised in the practice of Christian virtue, in goodness and holiness, and he will have a more difficult time bringing down their souls. And so the devil, again, does everything he can to undermine the stability of the family, to turn children against the parents, to turn parents against one another, to sow discord and strife and disobedience and rebellion into the home. And that is why it is so important for families to consecrate themselves to the Holy Family, and to pray the family rosary, family prayer, in order to remain united and strong in the faith. And let us reflect for a few minutes on the various roles in the family. You have the father who can look to St. Joseph as his model. The father is the head of the home. This is very clear in Scripture, that the father is the head, and it is his role to guide the family, to lead the family to God, to make difficult, important decisions. His wife, on the other hand, will support her husband. And she is the heart of the home, just as our Blessed Mother was of the Holy Family at Nazareth. The mother will have the most lasting influence on the children. It is the mother's teaching, her daily instructions, her words of of guidance, of counsel, and of teaching that will be most remembered by the children or will have the most lasting effect. And children have no one else but the Son of God himself to look to as a model 
in obedience, submission, charity towards the other family members, respect for their parents. So if every member of the family circle looks to the Holy Family and imitates the examples we have from Jesus, Mary, and St. Joseph, then the family will be a wonderful place to live. The family will have peace and harmony in the home. And again, virtue will grow. Vocations will be engendered in such a family. So this feast is very important. And it is amazing for us to, to read how our Lord, after he was found in the temple, now of course, being God, our Lord knew exactly what he was doing. He remained behind in Jerusalem. And when the caravan left for the various pilgrimage, pilgrims that came from Galilee, from the area of Nazareth, the men typically traveled, traveled separate from the women. So our Blessed Mother thought that now our Lord was 12, he would travel with the men. And St. Joseph thought, well, our Lord was with his mother, as he typically was, at least before the age of 12. And so neither, neither of them thought about it until they came together to camp at the end of the first day's journey, and they could not find him. And it was too late in the day. It was now dark. They couldn't go back to Jerusalem. The next day, they journeyed all the way back. And on the third day, they found him. And his mother said, Son, why hast thou done so to us? Behold, thy father and I have been seeking thee, sorrowing. And he said, How is it that you sought me? Did you not know I must be about my father's business? Now it says they did not understand his words, what he was telling them. But that doesn't mean that they did not know he was divine. They certainly knew that. The angel had revealed it to Our Lady at the Annunciation and also to St. Joseph in a dream. Furthermore, at our Lord's birth, the shepherds told our Blessed Mother and St. Joseph of the wonderful things that the angel said. Then they saw the Magi come and worship the infant, the infant king, falling down, they adored him. So Our Lady and, our, and St. Joseph knew that Jesus was God, that he was divine, and that he certainly had his father's business to do, but they did not understand that he wanted to give them a glimpse of what he would one day do. Because when our Lord went forth in his public life, just as he had done at the age of 12, he spoke as no man had ever spoken. And at the age of 12, it says the learned men were amazed at his wisdom and his answers. He was listening to them and asking them questions. And they were amazed. And our Lord wanted to give the example, not only that he could have at that age of 12 begun his public life, but especially the example of not doing so, but returning to Nazareth and submitting for 18 more years to a hidden life of submission, sanctifying family life. What a wonderful example we have in our Lord and in the members of the Holy Family. How important the family is in the eyes of God. Now certainly, no human family is perfect, we all have our faults and failings, but we must strive towards that model. And notice what our Blessed Mother did after she found our Lord in the temple, and he said those words to her. Why were you seeking me? Did you not know I must be about my father's business? It says the next line is, his mother kept all these things carefully in her heart. That means she meditated upon them. She reflected, she meditated on the words of her son and on his example and his life. And that's what we need to do as well, to reflect, to meditate upon the will of God for us in our lives, in our role. Reflect upon it, meditate upon it, and then pray for the grace to fulfill our role in the home and in our state of life. So let us today, you families, Reconsecrate your family to the Holy Family and look to them for the perfect example 
of how you should live in the family circle in order to have and enjoy that peace, that harmony, and the grace of God that comes to those families who strive to live according to the model of the Holy Family. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.